Hey guys, it's Lior. Welcome back to The Reading Project. Today we're going to read about the first African American Justice of the Supreme Court. Thurgood by Jonah Winter and Brian Collier. Normally, you don't look at a sandbox full of toddlers and say, Little Jimmy, there is going to become a world famous lawyer. But there was this little boy named Thurgood, who was by all accounts a born lawyer. The first evidence? At age six, he convinced his parents to legally change his name to Thurgood. Well, this Thurgood character would grow up to change more than just his name. He would change the law of land. Here are the facts of his case. It's 1922, Baltimore. A 15-year-old black kid is trying to get on a trolley with an armload of hat boxes he has to deliver. He accidentally bumps into a white woman. A white man calls him a hateful word and shoves him off the trolley. The kid, whose dad has taught him to never take that kind of abuse, punches the man and gets arrested, even though he's just 15 and was acting in self-defense. His white boss comes to jail and manages to get him released. The kid's name? Thurgood Marshall. For Thurgood, such things are just a fact in life. Fact. As a black kid growing up in America during the 1920s, Thurgood was forced to attend a blacks only school called Colored High School. Unlike Baltimore's all white schools, it had no library, gym, or cafeteria. It was so overcrowded that half the students had to go in the morning and half in the afternoon. Fact: From a classroom window, Thurgood could hear the sounds of the white cops beating confessions out of black suspects in the police station across the street. This was the world he was born into, a world where black people had few legal rights. Fact, Thurgood's dad worked at jobs where he had to serve and bow to white people, including a country club that didn't allow black people as members. Thurgood saw how these jobs hurt his father. He saw the rage that boiled inside him. But he also learned some things from his dad. He learned about courtrooms and lawyers. His father used to take him to trials, and there they would sit watching lawyers argue about justice and injustice, guilt and innocence, truth and falsehood. Back at home, over dinner, his dad would engage him in arguments about these trials, about the news, about anything. He would raise his voice, demand that Thurgood back up his points with evidence, and Thurgood would put it right back to him, word for word, point for point, with glee, with fire. As it turned out, this sloppy kid with untucked shirt and ink-stained pockets had a knack for arguing. He became captain of his high school debate team. Unparalleled in his debating and talking skills, he gave epic classroom presentations, so long that his teachers would have to cut him off. No one could outtalk Thurgood, especially once he went to college at Lincoln University in Pennsylvania, where right away he made his mark as the loudest talker, funniest joke teller, and best arguer of them all. As the star of his college debate team, he earned the nickname The Ratful Marshal. Fact: One day Thurgood was in a theater when the ushers told him and his friends they had to move to the colored section. Instead, they tore down curtains and knocked over a bunch of stuff, fleeing before the cops arrived. In a single moment, Thurgood saw that it was possible to fight the injustice he'd experienced his whole life. Breaking the law was one way practicing civil disobedience. Changing the law was another, and this way interested Thurgood far more. Fact, by his senior year, this born lawyer knew what he wanted to become, but the law school he hoped to attend 
the University of Maryland did not accept black students. The law said separate but equal. Schools for blacks and whites were perfectly legal. So Thurgood went to the historically black school that would accept him, Howard University in Washington, D.C., where he would hone himself into a one-man weapon to destroy the laws that hurt black people. He became the star pupil of the great civil rights lawyer, Charleston Houston, who trained his students to challenge legalized racial segregation in forced separation. Houston took Thurgood on a road trip to the Deep South to study the segregated schools for black and white kids. Fact. Unlike the white kids' schools, the black kids' schools had dirt floors and no restrooms. The students were malnourished and sad. Separate but equal? Yeah, right. Well, can you guess what Thurgood's first major legal battle was once he graduated and became a lawyer? It was against the very law school that would not accept him because of his skin color. A lawyer's job is to convince a judge or a jury of what is just and unjust, true and untrue. It is to present facts and evidence. Thurgood presented the facts. The University of Maryland had no legal right to bar his black client from its law school. As a citizen of the United States, he was entitled to equal treatment because of the Equal Protection Clause in the 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Verdict? The law school would have to accept black students. Victory. Because this was just a Maryland court case, its ruling didn't apply to the whole country. Still, it sure did impress the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. In 1936, it hired him as a full-time lawyer at its headquarters in New York. Within two years, Thurgood was the NAACP's top lawyer. Fact: In the South, Jim Crow laws required black people to drink from colored drinking fountains and sit in colored waiting rooms. They were not allowed to vote. They were not allowed to eat in restaurants owned by whites, stay in hotels owned by whites, or sit where they wanted to on the bus. This was the law, and Thurgood took it on. Fact, on most trips, Thurgood made to the South to fight a legal battle. There were threats to his life. Every night he had to eat and sleep in the house of a local black person. Sometimes there were armed guards posted outside. Was he scared? Don right he was scared. Once in Tennessee, Thurgood was driving with some other lawyer down a country road when the police pulled them over. They arrested Thurgood, pushed him into their car, and took off. The police car turned down a dirt road that led into the woods. When they got to a lake, Thurgood saw a group of white men just standing there, waiting. He knew they were planning to kill him. Thankfully, the lawyers had followed. The police spotted them and turned around. Back at the station, they falsely charged Thurgood with drug driving. He was released by the judge, then driven out of town by his friends in the dead of night. This was the world Thurgood had to enter just to do his job. Fact. In the Deep South, most whites sitting in the courtrooms had never even seen a black lawyer. And there he was, in his fancy suit, trying to change their laws. It filled them with hatred. Thurgood's response was not anger, or none he let them see. No, Thurgood kept his cool. And in the midst of their hatred, Thurgood changed their laws, case by case, trial by trial, winning 29 cases before the Supreme Court. Cases that gained important rights for African Americans. Cases that defined the law of the land, standing before those nine robbed justices, Nine white men, he took on injustice again and again. He fought for the equal protection of all citizens, promised 
by the U.S. Constitution. With every battle, Thurgood took a sledgehammer to racial inequality in America. With every battle, he built his reputation as Mr. Civil Rights, a nickname he earned by demolishing one racist law after the next. But his biggest battle was yet to come, and he had spent his whole life preparing for it. Injustice. A man named Lonnie Smith tries to vote in a Texas primary election and is turned away because he's black. Justice. Thurgood argues that the Constitution protects the right to vote for all citizens, not just white people. The Supreme Court agrees. The law now protects the rights of black people to vote in primary elections thanks to Thurgood. Injustice. A woman named Irene Morgan refuses to give her seat to a white person on a bus going from Virginia to Maryland. She is dragged off the bus and arrested. Justice. Thurgood argues that Irene Morgan's rights as a citizen, as protected by the Constitution, have been denied. The Supreme Court agrees. It is now illegal to deny black people the right to sit where they please on a bus between states, thanks to Thurgood. Injustice. A couple named Ethel and J.D. Chalet tried to purchase a house for their family in a white neighborhood in St. Louis and are denied because they are black. Justice. Thurgood argues that the Shelley's rights as American citizens have been violated. The Supreme Court agrees. It is now illegal for a white person to refuse to sell a house to a black person, thanks to Thurgood Marshall. Injustice. A man named Oliver Brown attempts to enroll his children in an all-white school in Kansas, and they are rejected. If Thurgood can prove in the Supreme Court that the Brown children have a constitutional right to attend this school, he will have proven that all black children in America have the right to attend any public school. When Thurgood stood up to present his argument, he spoke in a booming voice that filled the room. This case, this moment, was why he had been put on this earth. It was the most important battle he had ever fought. If he won, it would make all the difference for millions of American school children, for the soul of the nation, for the ideal of racial injustice in America. He came on like a locomotive. Was he angry? after a lifetime of being treated like a second-class citizen because of the color of his skin, after enduring all that hatred, all these hurtful laws intended to keep black people powerless? Darn right he was angry. But if he wanted to win this case, he had to prove his argument, word by word, point by point, with evidence. Thurgood said that segregation hurts the development of the personalities of black children. It causes humiliation and actual injury. He brought in psychologists to testify. He presented photographs of all white schools and all black schools. He argued that as long as there are separate schools, there can be no equality. He said, equal means getting the same thing at the same time and in the same place. Listening to his powerful argument, seeing the injustice he described, every single one of those nine white Supreme Court justices agreed. Thurgood had won. The case of Brown versus the Board of Education was decided. The age of legally separating the black and white children in schools was over. But Thurgood's career was far from over. He would go on to integrate more than just schools by becoming the first black Supreme Court justice in history. Justice. The end. Thank you so much for watching today's video, and I hope I will see you next time. Bye!